So we start chapter three today. The chapter is called Test of Self-Realization. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about a test. <laughs> test of self-realization. So what happened so far? The story so far is that Janaka asked Ashtavakra for help to discover himself, to find the self. And then Ashtavakra spoke for the first chapter. And then in the, and started speaking from that discovery self, as the self. Beautiful second chapter was all about Janaka sharing his discovery. And typically what a master will do is not just take your initial word for it because they know, the masters know that it leads a spiritual ego can come after that. So they keep poking you a bit, prodding you a bit. So the test of self-realization is Ashtavakra saying, so he said, having realized yourself as one, being serene and indestructible, why do you desire wealth? Now, Janaka didn't say he desired wealth, but the question came because Janaka was the king. Okay? So, Ashtavakra is prodding to see if there's some attachment still that remains to the wealth of the kingdom. Just as imagining silver in mother of pearl causes greed to arise, so does ignorance of self cause desire for illusion. Okay? So, we've discussed all this in great detail in the past, so I won't elaborate much. If some, if you have a question, you can stop me and I can look at that. Just as imagining silver in mother of pearl causes greed to arise, so does ignorance of self cause desire for illusion. Having realized yourself as that, in which the waves of the world rise and fall, why do you run around in turmoil? Having realized yourself as that, in which the waves of the world rise and fall, why do you run around in turmoil? Having realized yourself as pure awareness, as beautiful beyond description, how can you remain a slave to lust? Having realized yourself as pure awareness, as beautiful beyond description, how can you remain a slave to lust? The key point there is a slave to lust. I'm not saying that lust should not arise. I think don't be a slave to it. It is strange that in a sage who has realized self in all and all in self, the sense of ownership should continue. So Ashtavaka is really poking with all different ways. So he's talked about well desire for illusion, running around in turmoil, it's all about doership, or kingly duties, remaining a slave to lust, and the sense of ownership, the sense that something belongs to me or something is mine. You see, me and mine, this attachment that we've often spoken about. Strange that one abiding in the absolute, intent on freedom, should be vulnerable to lust and weakened by amorous pastimes. Strange that one abiding in the absolute, intent on freedom, should be vulnerable to lust and weakened by amorous pastimes. Strange. As the enemy of knowledge, one so weak and nearing death should still crave sens sensual pleasure. Strange that knowing lust as an enemy of knowledge one so weak and hearing death should still crave sensual pleasure. Strange that one who is unattached to the things of this world and the next, who can discriminate between the transient and the timeless, who yearns for freedom, should fear, should yet fear the dissolution of the body. So everything, now death spoken. Strange that one who is unattached to the things of this world and the next, who can discriminate between the transient and the timeless, who yearns for freedom, should yet fear the dissolution of the body. Now this is uh, 
not something which is rare. This fear of death, even for those who have been in satsang, who see themselves beyond this worldly play, this fear can be such a strong condition. You see, so this fear can be such a strong condition. I saw coincidentally that uh, Olga was also here today. So she she is one of those who told me that this fear of death is a very strong feeling, the sense of death. You see? She said once to me that at least if I know I'm the self, at least I know it continues. So there is no end. You see? But it, even this cannot be used as a crutch in that way, you see. Of course, you're discovering yourself to be that which is beyond time and space. But you're also finding yourself to be that which is prior to all attributes. Is that one concerned about even life? Is the play of existence really something which makes a real difference to the self? Finding the self, you see yourself to be beyond life and death, beyond birth and death. You are the unborn, the undying. It is this, many times it is a manifestation of this fear which comes, which can seem to be an obstacle to our remaining empty of concepts. Any of you feel like this, you might not put it in this way, you might not express it in this way, but when you don't have a concept about yourself, you can feel something very shaky as if you are dying and the mind will immediately come and say no 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 don't go there that that is trouble you see? and the master is saying no no stay there and see if that is really trouble stay here and see if that is really trouble or is it just the mind saying it is trouble What is that final drive to pick up a belief about ourselves, to make a position about yourself? This, it is an escape from this fear of dissolution. And many have actually come to this point and in the play returned. <laughs> In the play returns when they find that it is relentless, are looking for the self and staying here. And they find that really there is no room for belief in your personal identity. When you discover that nothing that you are finding here is making a spiritual person or an enlightened person out of you, you are asked to let go of all the concepts. You are not becoming a good person. You are not becoming definitely not becoming a better person. Okay, in the in the play. That's not, okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> don't pick up the opposite idea okay they saying that this is not personal beyond this we go beyond birth and death as you allow yourself to remain empty right now notice the mind's offers for you to take a position the position is based on past position is based on future the position is based based on wanting something position is based on doing something the position is based on some sensation that you might be experiencing what is the door for this me naturally right now there is no such me can really slow it down prior to the concept about yourself what is it that you are whether acclaimed or tormented the serene sage abides in the self he is neither gratified nor angered a great soul and notice again that uh, although the words might sound like it but it does not imply that gratitude or anger cannot come it only implies that even these are seen as aspects of your phenomenal manifestation there is no resistance to this but you are not saying that i am and we or i am plus good a great soul witnesses his body's actions as if they were another's how can praise or blame disturb him so we have spoken about doership realizing the universe is illusion having lost all curiosity how can one of steady mind fear death the whatever candy this phenomenal realm has to offer even that pales in comparison to your non phenomenal discovery how can that be see the mind cannot understand this in many times in satsang we just hear that yes yes i have found the self but is that it but it's so boring there's nothing happening there is it so this is when the recognition has been given too quickly to the mind to interpret whereas in reality what is our experience we see that any form of sensory pleasure any form of perception we tire of very quickly consciousness doesn't want to deal with it for too long it doesn't want to have the best things i have spoken like i talked about the best music or the best taste the best whatever if it is constantly only that you will say no i want the contrast 
So it cannot be that the discovery of the self will have a particular quality or a taste. Because even that, consciousness will tire off. Consciousness is made up of all the opposites. So if it is only playing as one aspect of the opposites, then it will want to include the other aspect also. So that is the play of consciousness. In this, dual, in this realm of duality, it plays as every aspect. It doesn't want just one side of the spectrum. It is only the mind which is saying, no, no, only this should be there. Only this should be there. This should be there. So then, what is happening now? As you are coming to the discovery of the self, then you might struggle to use words like it is so pure, it is so innocent. Actually, none of these also apply. It is empty even of these attributes, beyond purity, beyond innocence. You are coming to the discovery of this quality-less self. And yet it is not empty like an empty glass. It's not empty in the way of an empty room. Like it's so boring, there's nothing there. You see, it's not that. It is full of the non-phenomenal. Can we say like that? It is full of the non-phenomenal. That fullness from which all other things arise, all phenomena arises. Even consciousness arises from that. See? So don't fall into that notion that the emptiness that we speak of is that kind of emptiness which is just so devoid. It is very the void, but it is not devoid of anything. It is not phenomenal, yet it is a complete taste of fullness. If the sages made this discovery that I found the self and it is just like walking into an empty room. Why would they want everyone to join them in this empty room? So it's not that kind of emptiness. It is not, not an empty coconut. It is that which is the source of all things, including intelligence, supreme intelligence also arises from that. With whom can we compare the great soul who, who content knowing self remains desireless in disappointment? Why should a person of steady mind who sees the nothingness of objects prefer one thing to another? He who is unattached, untouched by opposites, free of desire, experiences Neither pleasure nor pain as events pass through. Okay. This also has some capacity for misunderstanding. Pleasure and pain will be experienced, but he will not say, I am the experiencer as an individual entity. There is no sufferer. There is no enjoyer. As if it is something limited. It is all happening in the space of your existence. This much, all of you will be able to testify, whether it's your first satsang or you've been here for years, that without your existence, there can be no experience. So this, your existence is a substratum for all experience. Even though it might not yet be your insight, that all of this is happening in the space of my being, in the space of my existence. That really doesn't matter at this point. Know that 
you are that in the presence of which all experiencing can happen. That much is enough for now. But in the, that we, in the presence of which experiencing is happen, happening is not affected by whether the experience is that of pleasure or that of pain. The body might still be going, ouch, ouch. See, do expect that this, this is going to make you into the man of steel, superman of steel. <laughs> is it? Hear the Ashtavakra and then you'll be, the body will be leaping over buildings and even if you're yeah, cut by knives or fired at by bullets, it's not about the body. You find yourself to be beyond this. You come to the discovery that Shivoham, which cannot be cut, it cannot be burned. In that way. And know that the vibrancy of experience will continue. Both pleasure and pain, the spectrum will be felt. But you will not amplify the seeming suffering because of your mental conceptualization. Like a child. The most beautiful thing, isn't it, with children? When they're in pain, they cry. Next moment they forget about it, they start laughing. And then pain comes again, they start crying. It's very, very natural. They are not holding on to grievances and resentment and pride. Okay, so I just want to read a few more verses, uh, which is Janaka's ah. response. So chapter 3 was that, now we start chapter 4. So chapter 4 is the glorification of self-realization. So this is the response from Janaka. So Janaka said, Surely one who knows self, though he plays the game of life, differs greatly from the world's bewildered burden, peace. Surely one who knows self, though he plays the game of life, differs greatly from the world's bewildered, burdened beasts. So he's trying to explain now because Ashtavakra pooped him with all the possible identity of money and work and kingdom and all of these things. So he's trying to explain, he's trying to respond to him, sharing that. He who knows the self, though he plays the game of life, there's a fundamental difference that happened. Mm -hmm. Not in actuality, but even in the play, there's a difference between the sage and that uh, expression of consciousness, which is still pretending to be a limited entity, a person. You see, so he's comparing a sage, the liberated one, to most of humanity which seems to be running about like bewildered, burdened peace. So that which burdens us, which bewilders us, which makes beasts out of us, all of that is this sense of individuality, the sense of identity. Truly, the yogi feels no elation, though he abides in the exalted state, yearned for by Indra, and all the discontented gods. Now don't worry too much about what I'm going to say, especially if you can't relate to it. I just want to say that in this appearance, it is possible for anything to appear. You, see? you might, in the next moment, find yourself living in a realm which is completely unidentifiable with this one. You, see? you might be appearing as if one of the gods, like Indra, as he's talking about, is it? Anything, anything might appear, is it? But that which is being spoken about here in the scripture is beyond any realm and any experience. So it doesn't matter what, whether you're a king or whether you're a god or whether you're whatever you might be. So this is beyond the realm of appearances, whatever, no matter how sublime or terrible that experience might be. So this is all that he's trying to say.
surely one who knows that with the capital t is not touched by virtue or vice just as peace is not touched by smoke though it seems to be who can prevent the great soul who knows the universe as self from living life as it comes so this is a great clue because don't expect that something should change in the events of life because of the discovery that you are making life can continue to be as it likes is it is a famous uh, zen saying isn't there before enlightenment chopping wood fetching water after enlightenment chopping wood fetching water but i like to add two words to that which is or not <laughs> even that can seem to become like a position that it has to be that way so many can say see now before something happened to this one he had a job he had work he had these things now after that he just left all of that therefore he cannot be enlightened by zen standards <laughs> so it is not what they're saying is that it is completely possible for the same seemingly regular day to day life to continue and it is completely possible that it doesn't actually anything can happen this is important because many times this can become a condition or position that okay so then now what i found this witness i found that it has no attributes i found that it is unchanging <laughs> so now what is supposed to happen to me where is my halo and where are my followers <laughs> where is my satsang program ajnabi career path Huh? <laughs> that's the only career. <laughs> He says that's the only career path, right? <laughs> Actually, I was saying yesterday that many who come to this discovery go on with their regular life with no, never really outwardly sharing such some in this way. But of course, their presence blesses everyone around them. So it is not. necessary for it to play a certain way is a beautiful uh, story because it's so so relatable once uh, someone who someone was in the sangha he was sitting with uh, guruji in satsang and he sat there and he felt like that day he was really just it was so clear the guruji's pointing was getting through it was just becoming so so apparent okay this is not one of those stories where i say oh a friend this happened to a friend but it actually happened to me it's not like that. <laughs> <laughs> so actually a friend he was sitting and uh, he just felt so clear so so clear and he felt that it was done what had to be done is done okay? so then what happened is that he start he starting to wonder so now what's going to happen you see as satsang is getting over he starting to wonder is, is it visible can people tell is there some radiance is it something can be seen is it you know this story actually so then he gets outside the satsang hall so swami satyananda ashram for those of you who know in rishikesh so he comes out and he sees this western lady coming to him with great intent ha huh? coming to him with great intent so he is wondering to himself ha ah, has it started now can she see it can she see it is it <laughs> what am i going to say i am exaggerating uh, but not too much <laughs> so like that it was it was feeling came and then she came to him and said are you the auto rickshaw guy <laughs> and he says in that moment all of this like <laughs> expectation of what should happen outwardly just fell away it doesn't have to 
there's a reason I don't take the name. So it's not helpful when you say it out loud. <laughs> It's a beautiful story because it shows us that even in the light of clear insight and recognition, the mind can come and play with some expectation. So what does this mean? Is it visible now? I wonder how my life will be now. Where are my devotees? <laughs> So, what did he say? Who can prevent the great soul who knows the universe as self from living life as it comes? Of the four kinds of beings, from Brahma to a blade of grass, only the sage can renounce aversion and desire. That's what I was saying earlier, it doesn't matter what form is appearing in life, what form you have. But only those who have seen beyond this nominal play can truly see that they are beyond this. Rare is he who knows himself as one with no other. Rare is he who knows himself as one with no other the Lord of the universe. He acts as he knows and is never afraid. Rare is he who knows himself as one with no other, the Lord of the universe. He acts as he, he acts as he knows and is never afraid. Guruji says something very beautifully. He says, it doesn't matter you see, whether, or let's put it on the, once you discover that this world is a dream, or if you discover that this world is a dream, it doesn't give any advantage to the dream character. See? There is no phenomenal benefits, at least outwardly, to this discovery. You don't expect anything out of this. See, because anything that you expect can become a benchmark, like an expectation. That only once I'm no longer angry, only once I experience free bliss, only once, whatever the only once might be, that becomes a condition, you see. And what are we doing? We are dropping all conditioning, even including the spiritual one. The movie is best enjoyed when you know, know nothing about the next scene. Okay, quickly, quickly, let's see if we can do chapter five. I know we're doing it very differently from how we've done the last few times. The last few times we looked at almost every word, but this time it's just coming up this way. But just stop me if you're confused by anything. And also the transcripts of the previous ones are available. And uh, in a few months or in a few weeks, it will be available as a book also, so so it's possible for you to refer to what was done, how it was done previously. So in chapter five, uh, is four ways to dissolution. This is very very beautiful actually. Four ways to dissolution. Where Ashtavakta says, so this chapter is just four verses, okay, and each verse is a great clue. Is a great clue. So use it like that. Take one, actually take any one of them, whichever appeals to you after hearing them and just marinate in that, contemplate that one. So first he says, you are immaculate, touched by nothing. What is there to renounce? 
the mind is complex let it go know the peace of dissolution you are immaculate touched by nothing what is there to renounce the mind is complex let it go know the peace of dissolution two the universe arises from you like foam from the sea know yourself as one enter the peace of dissolution the universe arises from you like foam from the sea know yourself as one enter the peace of dissolution and for this one all that you heard so far in satsang will also help you see that actually you are just seeing one appearance which is really happening as one play but we are breaking it up into many using the mind using concepts you see and you see that it is one appearance within yourself where is the experience of sound where is the experience of taste there is the experience of sight there is the experience of touch all of this is happening within you what is that you where this universe is experienced is there anything outside of you from your experience so let me repeat the words the universe arises from you like foam from the sea know yourself as one enter the peace of dissolution third verse like an imagined snake in a rope the universe appears to exist in the immaculate self but does not seeing this you know there is nothing to dissolve like an imagined snake in a rope the universe appears to exist in the immaculate self but does not seeing this you know there is nothing to dissolve so we talked about in the past we talked about the two a's that which is the primal witness this self is the capital a of awareness that which itself is not the small a of appearance is it so in relation to reality which is unchanging this capital a there appears this realm of appearances so in that way it is unreal because it is not unchanging it is not constant so the third way is to look at the world as an appearance and to stay with that which is not an appearance ask yourself am i an appearance So you can use this kind of contemplation. Fourth, you are perfect, changeless, through misery and happiness, hope and despair, life and death. This is the state of dissolution. You are perfect, changeless, through misery and happiness, hope and despair, life and death. this is the state of dissolution is it now many times what can happen is that as we are contemplating this we are not able to relate to ourselves as perfect and changeless is it but in our life we are blessed with the holy presence of the sadguru which is perfect and changeless so this is another way of saying what one of my favorite pointers which is to stay stay at my master's feet i keep your eyes at my master's feet if you can find your own presence in this way that which is perfect and changeless beautiful because this is the external embodiment of the master is just in service to this divine presence but if that seems confusing we are blessed to have 
presence of the master. And we can stay with that. Okay, so this is another way of saying surrender. So the sage said, you are perfect, changeless, through misery and happiness, hope and despair, life. Okay. Everything is the master's problem. Whatever events might come, you surrender. Just let it come and go. And if it feels like it cannot be let go of, just say it is God's problem or it is Guru's problem or it is Father's problem, whatever, whatever terminology you want to use. Don't pick up anything as your condition. Don't pick up elation or misery as your condition. Remain as this surrendered one who is saying, you are the one doer, you are the one experiencer, my Lord, my Father, my Sadhguru. I feel like in the last two weeks we've provided so many tips and pointers and clues to this. The sage said the mind is complex. Let it go. So to let go of this complexity, now you have got enough tips, tricks. Using the words of Ashtavakra and Janaka, we've got some very clear insight into what it is, what the discovery is like, what is the outcome of this discovery, what life becomes like if this discovery happens. Is it possible for everyone to see this clearly or not? All this has been answered. You know, for some reason it's sounding like a closing session. I don't know why. Although we will continue next week. <laughs> I think it's feeling to say that actually even this much what we've heard over the last two weeks is more than enough if digested properly. 